Hi, this is Mike Fauché, and today I'm excited to cover the new Slate 7 travel router from GL.inet. The GLBE3600 is their latest travel router that now supports two-channel Wi-Fi 7. Stick around for the rest of this video and check out the new features as well as how it performs. Don't forget to like and subscribe as it really does help support the channel. Full disclosure, GL.inet did send me the device free of charge. However, they haven't paid for or influenced this video in any way. All the thoughts, opinions, and results are my own. Let's start with the specifications of the device. The unit has a Qualcomm quad-core 1.1 GHz CPU and 1 GB of DDR4. It supports two-channel Wi-Fi 7 and now supports MLO or multi-link operation for increased connection speeds on supported devices. We'll see more on this when we test the device later in the video. Inside the box, you'll find the device itself, a USB power brick with country adapters, a USB-C cable, and a flat Ethernet cable. Looking at the back of the device, we see the USB-C port, one 2.5 gig LAN port, and one 2.5 gig WAN port, and one USB 3 Type-A port. On the side, you can see the reset switch and the mode switch, which you can program to do various functions, including enabling and disabling VPNs. The other side is primarily ventilation, and the bottom has the label that contains the default IP address, SSID, and password. The front has a really nice bright touchscreen display, and in terms of size, the new Slate 7 model is slightly larger than their previous models, such as the GL MT3000 that I've been using for quite some time. The Slate 7's touchscreen in the front displays a variety of information such as the local time, CPU and memory statistics, data transfer rates, and also provides a convenient way to, to enable or disable various functions such as Tor, AdGuard, WireGuard, and OpenVPN. It also provides a QR code for an easy way to get connected. Just point your phone camera at the barcode and it'll connect you to that Wi-Fi. There's a separate barcode for the 2.4 GHz, 5 GHz, and the MLO for any of the Wi-Fi 7 devices that support it. And lastly, you can easily switch between Ethernet, re repeater, tethering, and cellular connections. Initially, I thought the display might be a little bit more for show. However, I was completely wrong, and it's extremely useful, and it makes it real easy to get the features to enable and disable certain functions. The initial setup or to make global changes is best done using a laptop or a mobile device to connect to the device's admin screen. To do this, just connect the device using either the default Wi-Fi network, using the SSID and the password located on the bottom of the device, or an Ethernet cable if you're using a laptop. Once you're connected, then navigate over to the default IP address, 192.168.8.1, from your web browser and you should reach the admin screen. You're first prompted to change the default admin password and on the next screen you can change the SSID and passwords for all the individual Wi-Fi networks. You'll notice down below there's an option to enable 160 megahertz dynamic bandwidth which may or may not give you better performance depending on your environment. However, for the setup I would suggest leaving that off as when I tried it I had some initial drops in connectivity However, it worked fine later after I got the device set up. You can change this later to see if it works out for you, or more importantly, if it gives you the extra performance you're looking for. After setting the new Wi-Fi passwords, you'll be disconnected from that Wi-Fi network, and you'll need to reconnect using the new credentials. Once you're reconnected, log into the admin screen using your new password, and once you're in the front page, you'll be provided with some connection settings. In most cases, on a travel router, you'll pick the repeater mode, and the device prompts you to select the network to attach to. For this video, I'm going to connect to my IoT network as that's completely isolated. However, if you're using this in the field, you would connect to whatever local public Wi-Fi that you were trying to connect to. After selecting the appropriate network and in entering the password, the device connects and prompts you regarding setting up a VPN. I'm going to select not now as we'll set up the VPN separately later in the video. Clicking the wireless screen, you can configure the SSID and password for the primary and the guest Wi-Fi networks for the 2.4 GHz, the 5 GHz, and the MLO network. Again, we'll see the impact of these when we actually test the device. 
In the client section, you see a list of connected devices, the speed, traffic, and the ability to block that client. As there are currently no cloud services set up, we'll skip this section. The VPN section allows you to configure OpenVPN clients or servers, a WireGuard client or server, and almost any third-party VPN. We'll come back to this section when we actually set up the VPN. Under Applications, you have the option of installing various plugins, which we won't cover in this video. And in the next section, you can enable Dynamic DNS should you want to use this as a VPN server in the future. In the Network section, you have the option of enabling or disabling DMZ or add port forwards should you want to do that. Next, you have the Multi-WAN. Here you'll see a list of all of your current available WAN connections, or you can customize the configurations if you want to, as well as setting the sensitivity option for the failover. Should you have multiple WAN options here attached, they can act as a failover or load balance, and you can set the priority of these connections. In the LAN section, you can change your IP or your router, the range of IP addresses set by the router or the DHCP, and you can create fixed IP addresses by reserving them. You typically don't have to change these settings much, but it's nice that you have the option to do that. Under the network port, you have the ability to alter how your device is seen on the network you're attaching to. For example, if you're attaching to a network that scans the MAC address, some networks will actually block you if it detects a router of any type. If I set the MAC mode to clone my device, it will present itself as that device to the network, despite being a router, allowing it to connect to temperamental or very secure networks that only allow devices on there. Lastly, you have network acceleration. This uses a hardware compression or acceleration to increase your performance, and it's on by default. However, be aware that if you use it, client stats, bandwidth limits, and parental controls won't work. Under System, you have the device statistics and information and the ability to switch the USB from USB 3 to USB 2 in the event you have any compatibility issues with something that you plug into it. To quickly cover some of the main sections, you have a section for firmware updates, time zones, setting the toggle button. Here you can set the functionality of the button so that you can either disable the button completely or you can set it to enable a feature such as AdGuard, OpenVPN, Tor, or WireGuard. Just remember that on this model, all these features are also available from the touchscreen front panel. Lastly, you have the security screen where you can change the admin password as well as some other security features. Before we get into the benchmarks, let's see how to configure VPNs. Configuring almost any VPN, whether it's OpenVPN, WireGuard, or a third-party VPN is pretty much the same process. As the main use case for travel routers is typically in client mode, today we'll just focus on setting up a client. Starting with OpenVPN, we're going to add a manual configuration. Assuming that you have an OpenVPN server on your NAS or your router, all you'll need to do is download the file, the configuration file that you got when you created it on your NAS or router and drop it here into the box. As I use a unified gateway, all I did is enable OpenVPN and download the configuration file. Your setup may be a little different, so you may have to research exactly how your OpenVPN server process is done to get the configuration file. Once you upload the file, give it a name, add the username and password that you used when you created the configuration file, and you're good to go. This is the same process if you're using a third-party VPN such as PureVPN or another provider. Most support some type of open VPN configuration, so you may have to do a little bit of research. To set up a WireGuard is pretty much the same. Again, if you use a third-party service or one of these that are predefined, you'll need to follow the specific instructions for that provider. However, if you're running a WireGuard server on your NAS or home router, just drag the file that you got when you created your user on your WireGuard server and just drag it right into the box and hit apply. Give it a name and again, you're good to go. Looking at the VPN dashboard, you can see a listing of all the VPNs that you've set up, and you can enable or disable any of them from here. As I mentioned earlier, these can also be programmed to the toggle switch to make it easier for you to turn on or off, or they can be activated through the touchscreen. Now that we've seen the hardware and how to configure the device, it's time to do some benchmarking to see how this performs. I want to explain how I tested the device in order to establish the actual performance of the device and not the networks it's connected to. I plugged my WAN port directly into my switch, which is located on my LAN, so that I could test the device 
using Open Speed Test, which is located on my local LAN as well, as this will allow me to measure the actual performance of the device itself. I'll be using a laptop with a Wi-Fi 7 card for all the testing. The first test is 5 GHz performance using 80 MHz bandwidth. And as you can see, I'm getting about 600 download and about 597 upload. The performance is pretty good and rivals many of the home routers. Next, I wanted to see the performance if I switch to 160 MHz bandwidth. And as you can see, I got a significant boost in performance, getting around 860 down and about 809 upload. Your results may vary a bit on 160 MHz, so you'll have to experiment with your own environment and see what works for you. Lastly, I wanted to test the MLO or the multi-link operation. MLO attempts to combine all of your Wi-Fi frequencies such as your 2.4 and your 5 GHz to give you an increase in performance. As this is largely dependent on your clients and environment, your results may vary here as well. And as you can see from the results that I got, I was able to get about 1010 up and down, which is extremely good performance. This definitely rivals many of the home-based access points. I've owned various models of travel routers from GL.inet for the past 10 years, and they've always been very stable and reliable. Early generations were more aimed at the enthusiast and were a lot less polished. However, they have always been feature-rich with capabilities rarely found in other brands. My current MT3000 has served me well for years, and I still bring it with me when I travel, at least until now. The Slate 7 takes things to a whole new level both in ease of use, features, and definitely performance. As I mentioned earlier, I didn't think I'd find the touchscreen very useful, but I was very wrong, and it turns out to be a really handy and great feature. The performance of the device speaks for itself, and it performs better than any other travel router I've ever tested. Given the projected price of this device, this is sort of a no-brainer, and if you're in the market for a travel router, I would really recommend this one. This is feature rich and does everything you would want it to do and more. It makes it super easy to enable VPNs, AdGuard, and other features right from the front panel. There are many more things we can cover on this device, so if there's something you'd like to see or get more detail on, please post it in the comments. I'll also leave links for the device should you want to pick one up. Again, a special thanks to GL.inet for sending me this device to test. Well, that's about it for today's video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.